Hi, this is Rooted in Revelation, where we seek to make God's word the foundation for all of our life. My name is Nick, and I have my co-hosts Nate and Sam with us as usual. And today we have special guest with uh, a special guest with us, Guy Waters. How are you doing, Guy? Doing well, thank you. Good, good. Glad to hear that. Uh, Guy, what we usually like to do here is just have our guest give a brief account of their salvation testimony. It can be a really shortened version. And then uh, just tell us a little bit about who you are now and what you have going on. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I was raised in the church and short story became a believer in college when I met Christians my own age for the first time. And that was really the first time I was exposed to the gospel message. It was the first time I was exposed to the teaching of the scripture. And the, the Lord used that to, to draw me to faith in himself. And I was uh, a student not far from 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. And that was my introduction into Presbyterianism when Jim Boyce was minister of that congregation and uh, went on to Westminster Seminary after graduation. And uh, after that, did graduate study in North Carolina. And uh, when I graduated in 2002, was, was called to serve at Bellhaven College, now university in the biblical studies department, was there for five years, and then came over to Reform Seminary in 2007 and starting my 15th year there. Very compressed account, but that's the short of it. That's uh, that's really awesome. Um, so we actually just had a guy on who went to Bellhaven. Um, I don't know if you know him. His name is John McDonald. He's the president of uh, the North. Well, it was the North American Reform Seminary. Now it's the Log College and Seminary. Hmm. No, I, I don't know John. Okay, he was a student there. Uh, he probably wasn't there when you were, but um, he's from that area and and is involved in that sphere. So I. Wasn't sure, but uh, we wanted to talk with you about your book for the mouth of the Lord has spoken the doctrine of scripture, which is a wonderful book. And it's part of the reformed ex reformed exegetical and doctrinal studies series. And that's RTS is putting that out, right? Well, that is put out by um, Christian focus publications, their okay. academic imprint and my colleague, John Fesco, is a uh, RTS professor, and he works with Matt Barrett, who's, who's out at Midwestern, uh, good, good, solid Reformed Baptist brother. And they work together to bring in authors and produce this series. So it's, it's not an RTS series, but a couple of us from RTS have contributed to it. Okay, because I, I knew there were a couple guys from RTS that have books in this series. So thank you uh, for that. And um, what, I don't know if you know too much about this, because it's not really the focus of the book, but um, what inspired, do you know, the Reformed Exegetical and Doctrinal Studies series that, that they're putting out? Well, I, I think uh, that the short answer was that the, the editors could probably give you a much better answer than I could, but my understanding of the series is that it's designed to, to give a, a fresh contemporary statement of a reform doctrine. So not merely to restate the doctrine, but to show its biblical foundations, to show something of its uh, historical discussions, and also to address some contemporary questions relating to the doctrine. So in that way, it's trying to to be a service to, to students, to pastors, to teachers who uh, want to delve a little bit into the reform doctrine, understand uh, historically its formation, but also to appreciate some of the contemporary issues that we're facing today in relation to that doctrine. Yeah, that's really helpful because I have heard some people make the argument that there should be less modern books because really everything under the sun has been written. But it's kind of like you said, it's the rehashing of that for today that is help so helpful to us. And so we're, we're very thankful and grateful for the work that you've done uh, with For the Mouth of the Lord Has Spoken. Um, and did you choose this topic or was this topic recommended to you? Well, when the editors approached me, I 
propose this. They said, we'd like you to write for this series. And I said, what about something on the doctrine of scripture? It's, it's an area, just because I teach New Testament, that I've been around for a long time. And when I was a doctoral student, because I was studying in an environment uh, that by and large, the people around me were not inerrantists, were not committed to the inspiration of scripture. I took it upon myself to do additional work, building on what I learned at Westminster Seminary. And this has been something that has traveled along with me for a long time. So I thought this would be a good opportunity <clears throat> to put thought to paper. It would be a good opportunity for me to uh, be, be clarified and addressing some, some more contemporary issues that I've worked around, but if not really tackled head on. And it was an opportunity I, I just couldn't pass up. That's really awesome. And uh, the doctrine of scripture is so very important to us because it really defines everything we understand about God. Um, and I think you address that here a bit uh, in your first couple chapters, uh, even chapter three, chapter one's revelation, part one, revelation, part two, and uh, then chapter three is inspiration and inerrancy. Um, so could you just kind of go over when you say revelation, what do you mean? I think of the listeners of the podcast know since we've talked about that being rooted in revelation. Um, but would you mind just kind of giving us a brief um, overview of why revelation is so important? Sure. Well, if, if we're going to understand the scripture, I think we have to understand what revelation is. And revelation, of course, is um, something that is, is bound up in our understanding of scripture, but it's not unique to the scripture. Uh, and what I mean by that is we distinguish general revelation from special revelation or natural revelation from special revelation. And general revelation is what's addressed in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. It's addressed in Romans chapter one. Paul points to the, the wisdom, the power of God being on perpetual display in the creation, the things that are made. God is known through the world that he's made. <clears throat> and what we mean by revelation very simply is that God is disclosing himself. He is making himself known. We could not know God. We could not know anything about God uh, except that he has first revealed himself to us. I couldn't know anything about you. You couldn't know anything about me unless you or I chose to reveal ourselves to one another. That's part of what it means to be a personal being. So if we're to have any knowledge of God, he, he has to take the first step. He has to reveal himself. And it's important before we even get to scripture we need to recognize that God is first and perpetually revealing himself in the created order. That provides the context and the framework within which we come to the Bible. So when we come to the Bible, it's, it's not as though this is a lightning bolt from heaven. And here is the first and only time God has ever said anything about himself whatsoever. To be sure, what we have in scripture is the fullness of God's revelation. And he is saying things about himself and his works that he's not saying in creation. But <clears throat> we do nevertheless begin with God's self-revelation in the creation as we, we reckon with what the Bible is. That, that's really awesome. Um, and, and so you brought up general and special revelation. Um, a lot of our podcast audience has grown a bit, so I don't really know who the average listener is. Um, but could you explain what, um, maybe a little bit more, what special versus general revelation is mm -hmm. and why it's so important that we have both or specifically sure. special revelation, I suppose? Yeah, so general revelation, it, it draw, the word general draws from the fact that it is made known generally to all people in the world. And so, that God is, has made his wisdom, power, and goodness known to all his image bearers and the angels in the creation. And by virtue of my being 
a living, breathing human being living in God's world. I know God and I know enough about God to hold me accountable to him. I owe him obedience and thanksgiving. The fact that I don't do that by nature is not owing to any defect in revelation, in any uh, defect in the knowledge getting through. It's owing Paul stresses to sinful rebellion. So what general revelation does is it establishes the, the universal accountability of all human beings to God. There, there simply is no human being who does not not know God. Every human being knows God and every human being is accountable to him. So when the gospel goes out into the world, it doesn't go to blank slates. It doesn't go to people who have no conception whatsoever of God or even no personal relationship with God. The gospel is going to people who already have a relationship with God. It's a poor one because it's one of rebellion, but it is a relationship. And so that provides the framework for the proclamation of the gospel and importantly of special revelation. Now for all that general revelation says, and it says a lot, we need to understand a couple of limitations. For one thing, general revelation is not committed to writing. And general revelation also does not tell us everything that we might want to know about God, nor does it tell us everything that we need to know about God in order to be saved. It tells us enough to render us accountable, but it doesn't show us the way of salvation. And that's where special revelation comes in, because special revelation and special revelation alone reveals God in his saving goodness and mercy in Christ. And that's where the way of salvation is made known. That's where God speaks to sinners, offering them a savior, inviting them to Christ, speaking to them of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, of the church, and so on. But absent special revelation, we wouldn't know any of that. And special revelation is committed to writing, and it's been preserved faithfully through the generations, e even though Satan and the world have tried their hardest to destroy it. God has kept his word. He's preserved it. And we have a written record of everything that God wants us to know and to do for salvation. So that's why it's crucial that we understand general revelation coming into special revelation, because general revelation gives us the context. Special revelation is, is really the answer to the crying need and want of general revelation. I, I know from general revelation that I'm a sinner, that I violated God's law. Romans 2, the work of the law is, is written on the heart but it doesn't tell me what to do about it. It tells me that God is angry with the wicked every day. It tells me he's just and righteous and holy, but it doesn't tell me what can be done about my sin. And that's where special revelation comes in. Well, that's really awesome. And uh, I remember um, years ago, I went to a Bible college and it wasn't a reform school or anything. It was actually very thoroughly Arminian, but, um, when I went in, I didn't have much formal theological knowledge or training, and um, I remember sitting sitting through a Bible class and having misread Romans at one point in my life, you know, I, where it talks about, you know, those who were without the law becoming a law unto themselves by, I think, being obedient to it or some something to that effect and thinking, oh, you know, natural man can be a law unto themselves. They can live up to it, but you know, obviously that's not what the text is saying. So how would you, how would you respond to somebody who thinks that um, there is enough revelation in, in nature to save us, even if we don't have the Bible? Because there are some people that think that, and I'd, I'd be interested to your response. Well, I think the, the, the place that I would go uh, is in the New Testament's, particularly the New Testament's testimony, to Christ in the gospel, that there is acts for no other name given under heaven by which men may be saved. 
and the testimony of Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And, and so the New Testament is, is insistent. There is no other way to the Father but through Christ, whom the Father has sent. And we simply cannot try to get around Christ to get to the Father. That's just not an option that's open to us. Add to that the problem of our rebellion. We don't want to come to God. We're enemies and rebels and sinners, and there has to be some work done on us and in us before we have even the first and faintest stirrings of trust in Christ and love to God. So there simply is not, even if God had revealed a way of salvation in nature, which he, he hasn't, but even if he did, that wouldn't overcome our problem as sinners. We, we don't have some remaining ability or desire to come to God or love to God or work with God. We're enemies and rebels. And so th that, and that's probably something we'll talk about a little bit later. As wonderful and as important as the scripture is, that in no way militates against the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who works by and with the word to work on our hearts so that we may come to Christ in repentance and faith. So I think <clears throat> to say that either there's something of God revealed in the world uh, for salvation, or that a person can come to God as a sinner based on what is available to him in the world, really fails to grapple with what the, the New Testament itself says about Christ and what the New, New Testament says about the human heart. Amen. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, well, I think I have taken more than my fair share of question time here. Nate, I'm going to kick it over to you and uh, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean... I guess we'll continue onward, right? Uh, so we, we kind of covered general and special revelation guy. And, um, and, and going in now, we, I'd like to see if you could speak a little more about what, what, what inspiration means, um, maybe verbal plenary inspiration. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Um, and then, you know, I guess we'll start there and then we could talk about inerrancy after. Sure. Well, I think when we talk about inspiration, we have to be very careful at the beginning. We're not talking about what the Bible does to me. You know, we speak about a sunset or a work of art as inspiring. And look, the Bible is inspiring, but that's not what we mean by inspiration. We're not talking about its effect on the person. We're talking about what the Bible is in itself independently of, of what I think or feel about the Bible. <clears throat> and the word inspiration comes from a word that Paul uses in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And it's rendered in the authorized version, the King James uh, inspired. It's rendered in other versions, more modern versions, as God breathed. And the sense is that the Bible is breathed out by God. So it's not a book that God found somewhere and decided to adopt that as his own. It's not a book that's partly human, partly divine, 50-50. It is entirely the, uh, the product of God's breath, as it were. And from Genesis to Revelation, the biblical books, biblical authors testify to the divinity of scripture, that this is God's book, he authored it, it's his product. Now, he used human beings to write these books, and we have a diversity of human beings, we have a diversity of, of books, of genres, and the personalities of the authors come out. Uh, Isaiah is different from Ezekiel, is different from Paul, is different from John. So <clears throat> we in no way minimize that God used human instruments, but they were penmen of the Holy Spirit. They were writing by inspiration of the Spirit. The Spirit so worked, so superintended their writing as to preserve them from error and to ensure 
that every word they committed to writing was the very word of God. So the Bible is fully divine and fully human. And so even though the human beings who wrote the biblical books were errant, fallen, fallible human beings like all of us are, the books that they wrote, the biblical books that they wrote were not fallible or errant because this is God's word. And because it's God's word, it is therefore infallible and inerrant. And what we mean by that is inerrant, it's without error, infallible, it will never deceive or lead you astray. And so when we talk about scripture as inspired, you used two words, uh, Nate, just a moment ago that are important, plenary, verbal. <clears throat> and what those two words capture is that the inspiration of scripture is plenary. It covers the whole of the Bible, every book. So we're not exempting some book or some sections. Well, it covers letters, but not prophecy, or it covers the doctrinal parts, but not the historical parts. No, it covers everything. And it's verbal. That is, it is down to the very words. So we're not saying that God was active in the thoughts or the sentiments of the writers only. And then they, they took those thoughts and sentiments and, and put them in fallible human speech. No, we're saying that every word that they committed to writing is the very word of God. So it runs the whole of scripture, Genesis to Revelation and extends down to the very words. Uh, so we, we need to have a, a handle on this to understand what the Bible is so that we can read, interpret, and apply it the way God wants us to. That's great. Uh, Sam or Nick, did you have any follow-ups on um, inspiration and inerrancy? I am good. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk um, as someone who's kind of spent some time delving into the craziness that is King James only and Texas receptors only, um, yeah. if you could devote some time to plenary verbal inspiration and um, how that relates to manuscript differences and things like sure. that, or even cases where we're using, you know, the Septuagint or something to correct the, the Masoretic text and stuff like that. Right. Well, it's a great question. It would be worthy of a whole hour or more in itself. But I think we can say in short that um, God used uh, ordinary means and processes for the scripture to be copied and to be distributed. And so scribes copied the scriptures and those copies were copied and, and they were sent out. And um, we have no promise in scripture that, that that transmission would be without error. And in fact, when you look at the manuscripts and compare them one against the other, uh, there, there are any number of, of errors and discrepancies and differences. So when we, we speak of inerrancy, we speak of inspiration, we're talking about the, the so-called autograph, the original copy of scripture. Now, sometimes people will say, but we don't have the original copy of scripture, which is true. We don't have the original copy of Romans or the original copy of Deuteronomy, which we did, but we just don't. So does that mean that um, inerrancy is some kind of empty set, you know, some uh, pie in the sky concept that has no real world meaning? The answer of course is no, because when you look at the manuscripts of the New Testament compared to the manuscripts that exist from other books in the ancient world, two things stand out. One is the sheer quantity. I mean, we have over 5,500 manuscripts in part or in whole of the New Testament. A lot of major classical works, you could count on one or two hands how many manuscripts we have. And many of those manuscripts are fragmentary and have huge holes in them. So the, the sheer quantum of witnesses is staggering and extraordinary. The other difference is the age of those manuscripts. We have manuscripts going back to within a generation or two of the completion of the New Testament and extending out from there. 
a lot of the, again, the major classic works of antiquity, the plays of Aeschylus, the treatises of Plato. I mean, these manuscripts in some cases are centuries, even a millennium later than when those manuscripts were originally drafted. So the New Testament stands out in a remarkable way. There's nothing like it in the ancient world. And what we can do is we take those old reliable manuscripts, we compare them one against the other. And what we have with substantial confidence reconstructed is the text of the New Testament. So that's the, the uh, wonderful provenance evident in the preservation of the manuscripts of the New Testament. So I think when a believer does a little bit of study, if, if they're troubled by this, they ought to walk away uh, comforted and confident in the Bible that we have. So uh, we, we can take any good solid translation or good reliable um, uh, critical manuscript of the New Testament, hold it up and say, this is the word of God with, without crossing our fingers or without hemming and hawing. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, that was really good. Thank you for that, Guy. Um, so in chapter five, I believe you talk about our full persuasion. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. And, and what do you mean by that? Um, that we're, we can, like you just mentioned, we're, we're persuaded of the scriptures in a way that we can be confident, assured that we have the word of God. And I mean, maybe you can develop out from there a little bit and help us un under understand that. Sure. And of course, that expression comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith. And it, the, the background to this discussion is the claims of the Roman Catholic Church. If you ask a good, pious Roman Catholic, why should we believe the Bible to be the word of God? The answer will be because my church tells me it is the word of God. So in other words, we believe the Bible on the authority of the church. And, and that was something facing the reformers right at the start. They, they uniformly rejected that accounting of how we can have a grounded confidence that the Bible is the word of God without dismissing that the church's testimony is important and assuring in so many ways. It's just not the basis of our conviction that the Bible is the word of God. So going out from there, what Protestants have done is they've said, look, there, there are a couple of things that we look at. <clears throat> there are uh, the, the various evidences that God has given us. And, and those are spelled out in the Westminster Confession. Some of those evidences are external to the scripture, like the testimony of the church. Others are internal to the scripture, like the fulfillment of prophecy, the unity of the whole of the scripture, notwithstanding all of its diversity of, of time and place and genre and so on, it never goes off message. So there are, there are any number of evidences that um, of themselves point us to the, the deity, the inspiration of the word of God. But <clears throat> Calvin and others after him rightly said, well, that's, that can't be the deepest confidence of our conviction that the Bible is the word of God. And there they pointed to the, the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. And by that, they don't mean the Holy Spirit whispers in my ear in some audible way, the Bible is the word of God. That's not what they mean by the testimony of the Spirit. What they mean <clears throat> is that when, when a Christian is reading the Bible and sees these evidences, the Spirit confirms by his own ministry that to the believer, yes, this is the word of God. So when we arise from the Bible with confidence, having read it and having seen all the, of the evidences, and when we have that posture of submission to the word of God, believing it, trusting it, obeying it, 
trembling before it, rejoicing in it, and so on, then that's not the sum total of my, my mind thinking through all the proofs and evidences of the scripture, as much as my mind is working through those things in their own place and time, that's the, the fruit of the ministry of the spirit in my life. So we, we're trying to steer a, uh, away from uh, rationalism, which says that our confidence rises no higher than I'm able to argue and prove, on the one hand, and mysticism, which says, well, the only way I can know the Bible is the word of God is, is by some audible impression or whisper or movement of the spirit. And, and the reformers and the reformation tradition said, no, we're not going to go either of those places. We're going to honor the evidences, but we're also going to give place to the ministry of the spirit, giving the believer, every believer, uh, even believers who don't have formal education, that confidence that this is the word of God. You guys have anything uh, to add on there? Nope, that was uh, yeah, very enjoyable. So, yeah, very great. You know, guy, I'm just gonna say something really quick. I really love the way that you teach. I've never heard you do a class before, but you just have a way of. I know you have a chapter coming up on clarity, and we'll probably get there. But you are just so clear and easy to understand as you teach. It's it's really wonderful. I've really appreciated this conversation so far. So, well, I. Appreciate your encouragement. That's what I aspire to. And if I'm remotely hitting the mark, praise God. <laughs> yeah, I'll confirm that. So you got two witnesses. I'm sure Sam would be a third. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that that was really helpful, um, Guy. So now we're getting into a topic that probably has, has definitely um, some contemporary problems as well. I think of, uh, you know, the strong push and the, you know, the, the church with, you know, charismatic churches or all kinds of different churches that um, maybe not directly, but indirectly uh, maybe deny the sufficiency of scripture. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is the sufficiency of scripture and, and how sufficient is it? And, and maybe you can, you know, explain that a little bit for us. Right. And, and that um, you've raised just the right question, maybe because we, we have to be clear on what we mean by sufficiency. By sufficiency, we don't mean the Bible reveals everything that you might want to know, even about God and salvation. Um, there, there are some things that God has hid from us. That's the, the Deuteronomy 29, 29 principle. The secret things belong to God, but the revealed things belong to us and to our children. So we have to be respectful of, of the fact that this is revelation. We don't presumptively uh, lay claim to something that's not ours. I, I think we also have to recognize by sufficient, we also don't mean the, the Bible is saying something about everything. I mean, I don't go to the Bible to learn how to change a tire. Uh, I don't go to the Bible to learn how to do lots of things. And that's no uh, strike against the Bible. It's just that God never designed the Bible to be that. If God had wanted to give us a Bible like that, he could have, but that's not what he designed the Bible to be. So it's sufficient for the purposes for which God has given it. And then the very next question is, well, then what are the purposes for which God has given it? And the answer, classic Protestant answer, is that it's sufficient in two realms, faith, what we need to believe, about God for salvation and practice what we need to do to obey as those who would lay claim to God in Christ for salvation. So <clears throat> what that means is that there's, there's no doctrine that is lurking out there outside the Bible that I need to know if I'm gonna be saved. Everything I need to know about God and salvation is in these 66 books. And then obedience, there is no command that God requires of me that is not found in those 66 books. So I'm not going to get to heaven and find out, oh, I'm sorry, you, you missed four or five commands. They weren't in the Bible. 
you should have found, no, that's, that conversation will never happen. So everything I need for faith and practice is contained in these books. And when we get to clarity, we can talk a little bit about how I get that from these 66 books. But the, the important thing is that everything that we need to know for salvation is found in these books. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't know things about God from the world that he's made, natural revelation, but it does mean that it's these books and these books sufficiently reveal God for what I need to know for salvation. And negatively, I'm not looking for God to reveal himself in other places and ways for salvation. I'm not looking for him to speak to me through prophets or through internal suggestions or through mother church or through tradition or fill in the blank. Everything I need to know is, is found here in this Bible. That's really um, helpful. Go ahead, Nick. So uh, just kind of on that topic, Guy, I wanted to get your opinion on something. So sometimes um, as Christians, we love all of creation and we love the fact that God has given us the ability to use logic and understand and test things. And basically what I'm getting at is science. We we're creatures that want to know how we're made, why we're made and things like this. Uh, and I think sometimes as Christians, it, it can be um, a danger to have an improper balance of maybe putting science above the Bible at times. If we're, if we're looking at the science more heavily than uh, what, what we're looking at the scripture saying um, and, and science is only as accurate as the current day, because in 20 years, some of the things we know today might, might be proved proven to be uh, inaccurate. So could you just speak to that a little bit on how we should use science as a good gift from God so that it doesn't become an idol or skew our understanding of truth? Great question. And I think the first thing we need to say is that there is never going to be any in inherent tension between general revelation and special revelation. They, they both proceed from the same source. So what that does is it legitimates science as a pursuit and calling of Christians. And that's why, particularly in the 16th, 17th century, some of the most eminent scientists, like Sir Isaac Newton, were devout Christians. And their Christianity was spurring them, was prompting them to look at the world that God had made and to discern what God had revealed of himself in the world. Second thing I think we need to stress is that both special and general revelation needs to be interpreted. And revelation is, is infallible and inerrant. Our interpretation is not. And all of the alleged contradictions between science and the Bible really resolve in some way, shape or form into that. Either we're, we're not weighing fact against fact, or we're dealing with misinterpretations of either special revelation or general revelation, and, and people leap to the conclusion that there is some kind of uh, contradiction, when in reality, none has been proven. So the, the sheer fact, as you point out, that you know, science is always changing, and to yesterday's science, which was current and um, in the driver's seat, is, is now discarded because that's the progress of science. I think we have to be humble in the way we approach science, in the way we accept claims from science. I think we also need to be mindful that uh, our study of scripture is always subject to interpretation. And so when centuries ago, to take a, an example that shouldn't be controversial, uh, people discovered that the earth was not the center of the universe, that the earth uh, was orbiting or uh, rotating around the sun, then 
we went back to the scripture and said, okay, we need to modify our interpretation of the scripture. We, we can't insist on a, a geocentric universe the way we thought it was. And, and when we compared scripture with what we knew of the world, there was no harm done to scripture. We simply had to modify our interpretation accordingly. So that's, I'm giving a you know, very simple, even simplified examples. There are a lot of difficulties here, but I think what that calls for is a, a certain degree of humility that's often on short offer in, in a lot of these discussions. And, and simply to recognize coming back to our conviction that even if I can't sort all the problems out to my satisfaction, I still know this book is the word of God and I should never waver from that conviction. That should prompt me to study and learn and use the brain God has given me, but I, I should never waver from that conviction because I'm having difficulty uh, reconciling this and that. Amen. Thank you. Hey, Sam, do you have any questions from uh, the last little bit here before we move on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, questions, comments, things I'm going to throw out, and you can, you can respond to them or not. Um, two things. I really appreciate your discussion in the book of um, the dialogue with Catholicism on the sufficiency of scripture and how that, that two-tier model of, of tradition that is so prevalent in Catholic circles and that is official church teaching. Because I wonder, do you think we emphasize that enough in dialogues with your like your Catholic on the street because I coming from a Catholic background I know I think I would say the kind of vernacular Catholic theology even though it's not magisterial teaching is more in line with a Protestant understanding of what the word of God is um, in the sense that if you, if you said to someone well the church defines this they would say well no I think it, the Bible is the word of God you know what I mean so do you think that's something we, we could not, not exploit but use um, productively in, in dialogue with Roman Catholics. Right. Yeah, it, it is striking. You, you raise an excellent point um, that the gulf between the official teaching of the Roman magisterium and the conviction, the way that Catholics in the pew believe and live is, is often very wide. Um, <clears throat> you, you know, just look, look at the uh, official teaching of the church on birth control and look at the size of modern Catholic families. And it's pr pretty evident uh, <laughs> what's going on and how, how deep a hold that, that teaching um, has on um, Catholic sensibilities. But I think because, you know, out of respect for them and their tradition, it is good to point them back to what their church officially teaches. You know, this is what you're committed to. And, you know, if you're you're uncomfortable with that, and, and you seem to be agreeing with me, then uh, I think we, we can affirm that and embrace that and work from that. Um, you know, that's a positive thing in terms of our dialogue, in terms of our relationship with that person. Um, and I think we wanna be careful that we're always speaking of, of Roman Catholic teaching respectfully, you know, not setting up a straw man to take it down. But at the same time, doing so in the interests of clarifying differences between, well, this is what the Roman Catholic Church says about the Word of God. This is what Protestants say about the Word of God. And um, taking the opportunity where a Roman Catholic person in the pew may part ways with his church to invite them to consider Protestant teaching. Thank you. That's really great. Okay. Um, so here's one of my, my favorite ones to listen about and talk about is the clarity of scripture. Um, this is something I, I always hear the objections from uh, Roman Catholicism and, and adherence of that is you Protestants are responsible for 33,000 denominations. Um, right. And, and, uh, and in a way, I think, there's something to that. I don't want to completely discredit that objection because there is multiple interpretations in, in Protestant communities. Uh, I wouldn't say specifically as much in a reformed community, right? But broadly speaking, um, there is, you know, lots of different books and lots of dis uh, 
disagreements on lots of passages and the scriptures, lots of commentaries where they kind of bounce back and forth, and even just lots of books that go back and forth um, on how we're, whether it's covenant theology or whether it's, you know, something you've written about in the past, new, uh, new perspective on Paul and, and how we're interpreting the scriptures in light of culture in the past and how we're dealing with that in the present. Um, so first, maybe you could define what clarity uh, of scripture is, and then um, what, what, what do we do about that guy? Hmm. No, great question. And, and again, it comes back just as you, you said, Nate, to defining our terms, just as we did with sufficiency. What, what do we mean by clear? Well, what we mean is that the, the basic teaching of scripture and God revealed himself in scripture primarily to make known the way of salvation in Christ. That's the primary purpose of scripture. And that primary purpose is going to be clear in some place of scripture or another that, paraphrasing the Westminster Standards, even the, the unlearned in the due use of ordinary means can come to an understanding of it, that by that understanding through the ministry of the spirit, they may be saved. So what we're, all we're saying by clarity is that a, a person without formal education or training can pick up the Bible and figure out, this is what the Bible is about. It is showing the way of salvation. A child can do that. And we can think of examples where that's happened. Now that expression in the due use of ordinary means is important. It doesn't mean if you're illiterate and you pick up the Bible, you're suddenly gonna be able to read it and understand it. Um, you, you have to use means to ends. And those means chiefly include the proclamation of the word of God, preaching. So even if you can't read, even if you don't have the capacity to read a Bible, you, you can, through preaching, through hearing the Bible read, you can attain that kind of knowledge and come to salvation. You're not disadvantaged by your illiteracy. So we don't mean that all Christians everywhere are going to be lockstep in agreement about every single teaching about the Bible. I mean, for one thing, Peter tells us about Paul, there are some things in his letters that are hard to understand. So scripture recognizes that there are things that are easy, there are things that are more difficult, there are things that are clear, there are things that are less clear in scripture. And, and that's by, by design, that's the book God wanted us to have, that's the book he gave us. So we recognize that we're not all going to come to uniform agreement on every point revealed in scripture. The only way that we could would be if we had some authority over us to compel us to uh, squelch dissent and disagreement uh, among uh, Christians who, who differed. And that would be no real agreement at all. Uh, that, that would just be some kind of uh, external uh, compulsion, not the kind of agreement that the scripture calls us to. I think the other thing to bear in mind is that, uh, you know, Rome's house is not exactly in order itself. There is external unity, but there is vast theological diversity within the Roman Catholic Church, I mean, serious differences. Uh, often differences that outstrip what we see in conservative Protestantism among her bishops and her cardinals and her priests and, and her laity. So, you know, even Rome can't escape that charge. There's a, there's a curtain of unity in, in the Pope and in the councils, but behind that curtain are vast disagreements about what the Bible teaches. And that shows us that the church has proven historically incapable of achieving the kind of unity that Rome says the church can provide uh, the uh, Christians. Because what Rome says is, look, you're never gonna get unity, so what you need is the church to tell you what the Bible means. And, and that's our avenue to clarity. In reality, we have centuries of Roman Catholic theological history to prove otherwise. So I think 
defining what clarity is, not having a, a distorted view or a set of expectations as to what clarity is, and then also accounting for the realities on the ground in the Roman Catholic Church are, are all going to be critical to, to getting some kind of resolution on this question. My favorite quote about clarity uh, comes from Tyndale. And he said, I will cause a boy who drives a plow to know more of the scriptures than the Pope. And he was, of course, referring to translating it into the language they could read. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love that. Um, Guy, so I have a question for you. Obviously, the Bible is our primary rule, our sole rule for faith and practice. Um, but the Lord has given us teachers and authors and theologians, scholars, people who are experts on topics that might be hard to understand, you know, just from the scriptures themselves. Um, and it's something that Nate and I have talked a bit about, um, but I was wondering if you could give us your perspective on when we're trying to understand truth, the hard truth, easy truth, how should we approach that uh, in relation to the scriptures, uh, in relation to teaching or preaching, and in relation to books? Right. Well, I think we, we want to chart a middle way here. We, we don't want to despise those things and say, well, I can just pick up my Bible and read it and understand it without any help whatsoever. For one thing, God has given us ministers of the word. He's given us elders. We, he wouldn't have done that if we didn't need them to, to grow in our understanding of scripture. Scripture also tells us that uh, the, the scripture is to be understood and applied in, in the context of particularly of the local church. So believers have a ministry one to another of teaching, admonishing, uh, counseling, instructing. The Bible was never meant to be read in solitude or isolation. So God's given us these helps and we cannot expect to understand scripture or grow in our understanding of scripture. If, if we shut the door on those helps and say, I'm, I'm not going to do anything with them whatsoever. But, and, and this I think is where the, the Protestant uh, pushback can come, is when we see the excess, for instance, in the Roman Catholic Church, which in which tradition becomes virtually a dual channel of revelation to scripture. And we don't want to go there. We want to make sure that scripture is supreme over all helps, over preaching, over works of theology, over creeds of confessions, over the opinions of men. So what we have to do is ensure that, that these are simply helps, these are simply means. They are always subordinate to scripture. They are always accountable to scripture. They are always revisable in light of scripture uh, and scripture speaks authoritatively, uh, and those helps are only useful to us insofar as they bring us into the meaning of scripture. And that's a point that just has to be reiterated every generation, time and time again. So we need to make sure that we're not uh, running off either edge of the cliff here, despising those helps or making too much of them. Uh, and I think when we do that, we'll be able to, to appreciate and embrace the, the wisdom of saints gone before us. Because if, if we need the helps of the saints who are living, why wouldn't we need the helps of saints who have gone before us? I mean, just because you're dead doesn't mean you don't have something to say, doesn't mean you don't, I don't need to hear what you have to say in understanding the scripture. That's all part of the communion of the saints. So I, I think our conviction about scripture ought to drive us to embrace these helps, but it ought equally drive us to use these helps in the way that God intended them, in the way that scripture intends for them to be used. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's, we are, 
I was just going to say it was a uh, great answer. That was really helpful for me personally. Thank you. And uh, Guy, we want to be mindful of your time here. I think we said we'd have you for about an hour. We're a little bit over that, and we still got Barth and Ends. Do you have a few a uh, few more minutes to talk to us about that? Sure. All right. Well, Nate, uh, that's kind of your area of expertise, so I'll let you ask the questions here. <laughs> I wouldn't say expertise, but I'm aware of uh, I'm aware of uh, some of these things in the blogosphere and. I've seen uh, some of the popularity, especially with Carl Bart and his understanding of God's acts um, in the world and uh, his understanding of scripture has been quite popular um, in the internet, you know, world. Uh, a lot of people have been very influenced by him and his ideas um, and uh, his understanding of, in a strange way, I think they, they call themselves uh evangelical Calvinists or, or something to along, along those lines. That might be a side, side comment, but who's Carl Bart and why, why and how was he important? And then why his, why has his take on scripture become so influential? Oh, great, great question. I mean, in brief, uh, Bart, it was probably the, the preeminent theologian of the 20th century. He died in 1968. He was Swiss uh, in the Reformed Church, uh, became prominent uh, in the 1930s and 1940s for his uh, resistance to Hitler and the Nazis and, and did suffer for it. Um, and is, is known as the, the primary author of the Barman Declaration around 1934. Um, he is also the author of the, the Church Dogmatics, an unfinished, uh, probably the, the longest work of theology that has ever been composed, some six million words. And so he, it's an amazingly prolific um, feat. He uh, identified himself as reformed and had great appreciation for Luther and Calvin, though he believed that the 17th century, the, the scholastics, the Puritans uh, parted ways with Luther and Calvin. And we, we would differ with that assessment, but Bard is known for what has come to be known as neo-orthodoxy. And he embraces a lot of the language and ideas of uh, the Reformed confessions, but they're given different definition than orthodoxy has given to them. And that's part of the difficulty in um, reckoning with what Bart believes and, and what his students believe. But in, in brief, when it comes to the, the Bible itself, he did not and would not affirm uh, full stop, the Bible is the word of God. He, he argued the Bible becomes the word of God <clears throat> in the event of preaching. And so Jesus Christ, he says, is the word of God. And when the words of the Bible, fallible human witnesses to Christ, and he argued that the Bible was privileged as a witness to Christ. When that is preached, then the, uh, the Bible becomes the word of God and the individual has encounter with God. So I think you're seeing that Bart was very resistant to pointing to any text or thing and saying that is the word of God. It was something that happened in an event, it was something he believed uh, needed to respect the sovereignty of God. So he, he said, if you just point to a book and say that's God's word, that that was diminishing the sovereignty of God. It was God uh, coming to a person in the event of preaching um, and uh, revelation occurring in event in that fashion uh, by way of encounter that Bart believed safeguarded the, the sovereignty of God. Well, the, the bottom line is that uh, Bart really didn't treat the Bible itself, the text of the Bible, any differently in itself than a human book. 
And so he said it was um, susceptible to errors, uh, reflected the culture of its time. He was entirely open to the findings of historical criticism, uh, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and even though when Bart interprets scripture, he, in fact, I don't think anyone has found a place in his church dogmatics where he says this passage is in error. He has a much more reverent handling of scripture than his actual belief about the scripture would, would lead on. But he's very clear, you, you cannot identify the Bible and the word of God. And that, that is really the, the hallmark or the crux of Bart's doctrine of scripture. And so in, in practice, it, it allows him and his students to affirm uh, statements about revelation that are orthodox sounding, but at the same time, he refuses to affirm the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture and opens the door to uh, understanding the book no differently than any other human book, because that in the end is, is his conviction about it. Uh, very, very simple, even simplified overview of Bart on the subject, but Bart has had something of a renaissance in the last 30 or 40 years, particularly in academic circles and within evangelicalism, uh, unfortunately, appreciative, uh, uh, an appreciative renaissance. So it is something to, to be aware of. Why do you think that he has had that kind of a surge in popularity? It, do you have a guess as to, you know, what contemporary Christians like about what Bart was saying? Well, I, I think there are a number of things. I mean, you, you cannot but be impressed by his learning when you read the church dogmatics and just prodigious learning and scholarship. His, his appreciation for the Reformation tradition, he was lauded in his own day as a premier theologian in Europe and in the United States and the world over. So I think all of those factors um, mean that he, he is a force to be reckoned with. It will be interesting in, in light of the translation of a recent biography by Christiana Tietz, in which some a lifelong significant moral failing has, has now definitively come to light that will almost certainly prompt a reappraisal of Bart and his legacy. Um, but that, that remains to be seen. But there's no question as to his, his influence in the 20th century, his scholarship, uh, th that I think is, is beyond dispute. And I think would account for uh, someone who is inclined to look for a, uh, a, a learned, um, work of theology that in many respects is appreciative of the Reformation. I think that would be about the most generous uh, that I could put it. Thank you. Sam, did you have any questions for, uh, for Guy on Carl Bart um, and his ideas there? Yeah, um, just a, kind of a comment question. Um, my understanding is that Bart was kind of like, the, like a, I don't know if you want to call it a crypto or like a cautious universalist in the sense of like he wasn't willing to come out and say all would be safe, but that like he kind of like held left the door open for that. Do you think that has something to do with his popularity in certain circles today? And so far as like, both he's, he's I don't want to complete him and Rob Bell because obviously there's a lot of differences but um in the sense that they, they both have you know a low view of scripture to some extent and also are kind of flirting with these universalist ideas now I, I missed I'm sorry Sam that the, the person you were comparing Bart with oh oh uh, Rob Bell oh, oh, oh right right um well I mean what Bart does and I I don't really go into because it is a, a deep and full discussion, Bart's doctrine of election, and there's there's an ongoing debate in literature on this. Um, but <clears throat> this is part of a of couple of things going on in Bart. One is 
his the fulcrum of his theology is as he understood it he didn't believe that reformed theology had properly exalted jesus christ so he reconfigures election in a way that he believes gives the person and work of Christ his due. And that leads to formulations that suggest all people are saved in Jesus Christ. And then the task of preaching is not so much to call people to salvation in Christ, but to tell people uh, you, uh, God has saved all people in Christ, now uh, believe. Now, Bart was coy about this, and this comes out in Tietz's biography. And part of this, one wonders, is, uh, is, is Bart really shrinking from the, the full outworking of his own position and conclusions? But Bart also methodologically, in terms of his uh, method of theology, worked in dialectic, where he would put two opposing views or statements next to each other in the belief that out of that truth would emerge through the tension between those two contraries. And so that's why it's very difficult and often very dangerous to land on one statement of Bart and say, aha, that's what he, he believes, because you've got to read around it and you have to look at all the statements that he's, he's putting next to it. And that's why clarity and precision are often at a premium in Bart's writings. It's just sometimes very difficult to figure out what exactly he's affirming, what exactly he's denying. Part of that has to do with his method. Thank you. That was great. Yeah, that was really helpful. And um, I'm a, a big fan of Cornelius Van Til and, and I know his writings uh, are often very difficult to um, understand and read um, due to him, you know, talking a lot with, you know, idealist philosophers and that's kind of the context in which he's trying to communicate to. So there's, there's even, you know, very, a lot of, you know, obviously some differences on how, how people perceive Van Til and that whole realm as well. And he was around Karl Barth's time, um, I believe as well. He, he was. In fact, I uh, was just speaking last week uh, with a fellow here in Jackson who was a student at Westminster Seminary and drove Dr. Van Til to Princeton, where Karl Barth was speaking. And he witnessed the one meeting of Van Til and Barth. And uh, Barth gently chided Van Til for what he said was uh, misunderstanding him theologically. Uh, but according to this former student, paid some tribute to Van Til in uh, trying to come to terms with what Bart was trying to do. And then he said, then they both began to speak in German and I couldn't understand the rest of the conversation. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's one of those uh, meeting of the minds. Uh, one wishes that they had had more time or taken the opportunity to, uh, it certainly wasn't from one of trying on Van Til's end, but Bart never really reciprocated any kind of correspondence or exchange of ideas. And he only lived a few more years. Well, thank you for that little uh, dessert kind of a comment. Um, you know, I, I love hearing, I mean, we had Scott Oliphant on, I mentioned earlier before we started the show and just hearing uh, Scott Oliphant's story of, of knowing Van Til and going on walks with him and uh, just seems like such a great godly churchman and uh, very appreciative of Van Til. That's, right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we're going to move on to our, our last bear with us uh, guy. If we would tackle this one last question. Sure. Um, so Peter ends, uh, maybe we'll do kind of a, a similar thing where you can kind of summarize, give us a short biography of who he is, what he's about. And then what's, what's his take on the, the doctrine of scripture? Sure. Well, uh, you know, Bard is writing from the discipline of theology, uh, historical and systematic, and uh, Enns is an Old Testament scholar, uh, went to Westminster, Harvard trained, uh, taught at Westminster Seminary from 
nine, the 94 to about 2008, left in, in some controversy, considerable controversy, over his, his views of, of scripture. He published a book, uh, in I and I, um, in 2005, and it was re-released in, in 2015, 10th anniversary edition. And he's, he's sub subsequently published other books on the doctrine of scripture. And in that book, uh, he tries to um, reckon with what the scripture is. And he uh, works with what he terms the incarnational analogy which in short was something that was used very modestly and very restrictedly by Warfield and Kuiper and Bobbing, but Enns takes it in a different direction. And he argues that analogous to the deity and humanity of Christ, we, we need to see the scripture as human and divine. And initially, most of his reflection addresses what he deems the humanity of scripture. And for ends, humanity, the humanity of scripture means that the human authors reflect the culture and the worldview of the time and place in which they're situated. And so in that sense, the Bible is going to be bounded and reflective of the various worldviews by our lights, mistaken worldviews, cosmologically and ethically, even theologically at points. So if that's the humanity of scripture, well, what, what holds it together? And, and for ends, he says, well, it's, it's Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ is the one to whom the Old Testament looks and in whom the New Testament writers point as the one bringing fulfillment to the Old Testament. He eventually concludes that the deity of scripture really amounts to the human authors of scripture having had an experience of the divine and the Bible being a, a special or privileged book in that respect which is to say it's not the deity of scripture in any classical Christian sense. So what, what Enns was setting out to do was to work with the difficulties of the Old Testament as encountered in scholarship, and then to formulate a doctrine of scripture on that basis. I, I think when you look at a writer like B.B. Warfield, old Princeton Seminary, who is well aware of the same difficulties, he says, no, that's, that's exactly the reverse of the way you need to go. What you need to do is you start with what the Bible says about itself. And, and that was our discussion at the beginning of the hour. And then you proceed to the difficulties. So the, the problem, I think, in many ways that in terms of method that, that Enns gets himself into is he, he constructs a doctrine of scripture on the basis of these difficulties. And we end up with an entirely human document, uh, you know, not without religious value, uh, not without its uh, uh, pointing to Christ. I want to give him his due, but at the same time, it's, it's not the Bible as Christians historically have confessed the Bible, the word of God. Oh, sorry, I had to unmute myself there. <laughs> um, yeah, that's really, that's really good. And I, I've kind of watched ends, uh, Peter ends slowly. It seems like he's become more and more, it, it seems like it's been getting worse with every book that comes out. It, it started off kind of like, and in between kind of maybe looking for a moderate position to this full fledged kind of falling into a liberal, uh, almost like a very postmodern kind of grid of, of skepticism and uncertainty regarding the Bible seems to be a thing. I, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. And he's, 
you, you know, there's an apologetic emphasis. He's, he's trying to wrestle with the difficult questions. He's trying to help people in the church who are aware of, of these, these difficulties. But unfortunately, the, the way he resolves them is to um, give us a, a Bible that's, that's unrecognizable. It's, a, it's a, really a purely human document. Mm. Yeah, and in that case, it, it gets really tricky on trying to figure out, uh, you know, what's what do we want to say is important and inspired? How do we differentiate that with what isn't? You know, and I see a lot of people run into that common problem when they go into that that perspective of how they're doing their interpretations. It's like, well, yeah, the resurrection was a real thing that happened for our salvation, but all this other stuff didn't. But it's like, well how do you know that the resurrection isn't like the other thing that didn't happen? Right. And it gets tricky like that. Well, that that's right. And that, that's a point, you know, that I, I do raise in the chapter, this line between Jesus Christ crucified and raised and then everything else like Jonah and the fish historicity of Adam is not nearly as neat as he makes it out to be. Because to your point, the resurrection, yes, it is a core conviction and confession of Christian faith, but the New Testament writers are adamant, this is something that happened in history. It, it's an historical fact. And if, if we're going to go down the route of uh, skepticism or agnosticism or postmodernism with respect to history, I don't see how you keep a resurrection much longer. It, it becomes really an arbitrary commitment on the part of the individual. There really is no foundation on which to stand. Yeah. Yeah, that was really helpful how you laid that out, uh, Guy. That's been kind of my own thoughts thinking through his, his decline, unfortunately, and uh, praying that you know he'll return back to the fold and come back to a better understanding of the classical view of scripture and in, in order to, you know, just praying that the Lord would rescue him back. And, you know, it's, it's sad when uh, you see people, a lot of us look up to and admire and, and tend to get even very brilliant people that you think would never, never fall in that direction. It happens often. And, and even with the rise, I see a lot of people turning to Roman Catholicism and I see a lot of people converting in that direction that, and, you know, us, uh, I guess you could say the lay people that like to kind of nerd out about theology on the Internet that you you see uh, in all these, you know, with the YouTube channels and the Facebook groups, you see there's a definitely a strong pull to uh, Roman Catholicism recently and and um, Eastern Orthodoxy. And I know this has nothing to do with per se with the book, but there's def there's definitely this when you you forget about, you know, it's, it's sufficiency of the scriptures and we forget to forget about our history regarding this um, understanding of scripture it it leads you in all kinds of different directions that i think the younger generation is not taking into consideration these things as much as they should before they departed off from it that's right um and that's uh but i think that's a call to us uh, whether we're teachers or whether we're people in the pew uh to, to understand these things because they're in the scripture, they've been confessed uh, by the church and her creeds and confessions and um, never let it be said of anyone that they've uh, turned away from the teaching and truth of scripture uh, owing to laziness, a refusal really to come to terms with, with what it says, with what scripture says. Thanks for that, Guy. So we're going to be wrapping it up here, uh, Sam and Nick. I didn't know if you had any closing comments that you wanted to have or or if a final maybe departing question for Guy as he uh, finishes up his time with us. Uh, no, I just want to say thank you, Guy, for your time. I think this has been very beneficial. I think that it will be a great blessing to anybody who listens to Rooted in Revelation. And um Thank you very much for being on the show. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it, gentlemen. Thank you. It's been a delight. Great. So, Guy, if you would close us with an exhortation, um, 
uh, for the younger generation that's uh, has an interest in in the scriptures and theology and uh, systematic or biblical or apologetics, just kind of people that kind of like us that possibly our listeners are also like, what, what admonition and exhortation would you have for us younger guys that are growing in our faith and personal piety and also in our local churches? What, what would you, what would you say to our listeners and us? Oh, I'd, I'd say, you know, first and foremost, as Proverbs says, guard the heart for from it are the wellsprings of life. And, uh, learning theology is great, never neglect the heart. And I think social media gives us wonderful opportunities in, in learning and sharing, but it also lays profound temptations for us in that as well. So um, re- remembering Proverbs counsel, you know, let, let your words be few or words are many, sin is not absent, uh, be, be slow to speak, but quick to listen. Uh, learn uh, from the people that God has put in your life, the, the pastors, the elders, the older, wiser believers in your congregation. You're not there by accident. They're not there by accident. God has called you to learn with and, and from them about his word. Uh, don't, don't despise uh, the, the small things if God has set you in a modest church, because that's just the place he set you to, to learn and grow. And uh, never, never let mind and heart get out of kilter. God has given his word so that we would love him and we would love others. Super encouraging. Thanks so much for that, Guy. And so thank you all for listening to this great episode with Guy Waters. I would definitely recommend uh, giving him a search in your Google and, and see what other books he has published out there. And I would definitely recommend getting his book uh, for the Lord. uh, I'm sorry, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Um, Definitely check that out. I'm sure you can find that on Amazon or, or some other, uh, you know, whatever platform you'd like to get your books from. Uh, So guy, thank you so much for having this time with us. And this is rooted in revelation podcast. Until next time, God bless guys.